thank you all for being here. Thank you, Diane. Um, and also thank you, Blank Black Lawrence. Truly, it's been a dream. Um, and you all have been so wonderful. Um, yeah. So um, I'm going to actually read two pieces or from two pieces. One is a flash piece. So it's super short. Um, so flash fiction under a thousand words. And this one is actually well under a thousand words. So I'll read a flash piece first, and then I'll read from one of my longer stories. The first one doesn't have any ghosts, but just wait, just if you want ghosts, just wait a little. Okay. Um, so this is called Warnings. We'd been warned about running alone. We'd also been warned about walking at night, about bus stops and Uber drivers, about the hungry shadows of parking garages. We'd been warned and we'd warned one another about parties at Joe DiCarlo's house, Sarah's older brother, the lacrosse players who sat at the lunch table closest to the pizza station. We heeded most of the warnings most of the time, but we were runners and no one told the boys team to practice in pairs or avoid wearing headphones at night. Besides, when we ran, who could touch us? When we ran in the peach light of an early sunset or in the long gray dawn, we were of the world, but not in it. So that fall afternoon, when Lucy darted ahead of us, we only thought, show off. It was just practice during a week without a meet. There was no need to leave the pack so soon. Lucy was fast, probably the fastest among us, but she didn't always win her races. She couldn't pace herself. Um, she was usually so quiet and controlled. But sometimes, at the start of a race, she vibrated with a fierce energy that she couldn't rein in. We figured we'd pass her in a mile, easy, our legs chipping away steadily as she flagged. But after a mile and a half, we still hadn't caught her. We leaned a little further into the wind, lifted our legs higher. At mile two, no one even joked about stopping at Dunkin' Donuts when our course swung us by its orange lettering. We concentrated on our form. We measured our breathing. The metal taste that came to us during meets appeared. We wanted to beat her. She was our teammate, yes, but she always held herself a little apart. She did pre-calc problem sets on the bus to meets, declined rides home after practice, and never shared secrets at team sleepovers. She was Coach Walton's favorite. At mile three, Maria Elena finally said, where is she? She can't be far, we've got this. No, we should have caught her already. Maybe she veered off for a quick study break, Rylan said. Do you think she's okay? Maria Elena asked, it's weird. What options did we have? We kept running. We thought she'd be there at the end, waiting for us. A quick glance at her watch to hint at her disappointment. We finished the run, did our cool down exercises, joked about our numb noses, and still there was no sign of her. Coach Walton asked where Lucy was. We wondered if he'd noticed so quickly if any of us were absent. We shrugged. She was with, she was with us and then she wasn't. And then she wasn't, and then she wasn't. And then she still wasn't. We backtracked. We texted. We called her name. We checked the Dunkin' Donuts. We paired off and fanned out. We tried to remember who were her close friends. Later, there were police dogs. There were flyers on every telephone pole, and there was her strangely stoic mother on the Channel 4 News. And later, much later, there was her body by the bank of a river on the other side of town, her team t-shirt tangled in the branches of a nearby bush. In interviews, we told the police, but she was running. How could we explain? How could we make them see? When we ran, we removed ourselves from the world and all the traps it had set for us. When we ran, our bodies were only ours. When we ran, we were out of reach. Nothing bad could have happened, we insisted in those first interviews. She was so fast.
Um, all right. So now I'm going to read just the op just a short part of the opening of a longer story in the collection. Um, this one is called The Last Unmapped Places. Imagine, please, a substep, a sub sorry. Imagine, please, a September storm hugging the coast as it sweeps northward. Dark, moody skies with clouds so thick they seem solid. The apple trees in our backyard thrashing. A heavy blue tarp draped over whatever project my dad was working on at the time, loose and flapping in the wind. The ocean, only a few miles from our house, roiling along the jagged shoreline. The rain arriving all in one rush, like an exhaled breath. My family inside, snug and languid and unaware of my absence. My mother stretched across the couch, reading. My father in the kitchen pickling vegetables. My twin sister drawing quietly at the coffee table. A crack of thunder so loud and so in sync with the lightning flash that my mother is about to say, that must have struck something nearby. She stops because my sister's hair is standing on end, fanned out like a sea anemone. Then my mother smells singed wood, singed earth, singed hair. Hannah is crying and my mother grabs her, but Hannah appears to be uninjured. My father rushes into the living room, knife still in hand. What happened? Why is she screaming? My mother smooths down Hannah's hair and asks her what hurts. Hannah continues to sob. Oh my God, my mother says when she realizes there's nothing wrong with this twin, the one safe in the living room with her and my father. Oh my God, where's Rachel? Hannah and I were eight at the time. I was outside by the backyard oak tree. The lightning cored the oak and then an errant arm of electricity reached for me. I was out cold for several minutes, and when I opened my eyes, the world swam in front of me like a television channel that wasn't in focus. Thanks to the miracle of Hannah's electrically charged hair, my parents were there when I woke, and an ambulance was already wailing in the distance. My mother loves this story. As family lore, it's irresistible. The raging storm, the twin connection, my mother's instincts, the proof of our uniqueness, and the razor's edge of disaster that only nicked us. I spent a week in the hospital. For several years, I had joint pain and occasional seizures in which my face went slack and my head snapped up and down like a skipping CD. I started getting migraines accompanied by blurred vision and moving colors and a strange settled sense of dread. But I was lucky to survive. The doctors and nurses told me so again and again. Still, I didn't feel lucky. I felt exposed. I felt like someone had broken into the house that was supposed to be my body, sorry, the house that was my body and moved all my things around. And the part of the story that my mother always left out of her frequent retellings. When my parents asked if I remembered anything leading up to the lightning strike, I told them that I'd been beckoned outside by a man in a black rain cape. His voice was low and throaty. His breath smelled like damp soil. When he gestured for me to walk in front of him and his cape opened, I saw that his arm was webbed. A pink flap of flesh ran from his wrist to his waist. His shoulders were high and hunched. I wanted to resist, but I was too scared of not obeying. Rainwater streamed over his face. He told me, the smoke gets thicker the further you go. We lived in a small town on the main coast where kids rode dirt bikes through the woods and walked without hesitation over barely frozen streams and had no fear of the dark yawning nights that seemed to swallow everything during our long winters. Even before the lightning strike, I was the quieter stranger twin. Afterwards, I grew jumpy and fearful which were great sins in our town's childhood kingdom. Hannah saved me from being an outcast. Whenever she sensed I was about to do or say something too weird, she changed the subject or caught my eye and gave a quick shake of her head. When I told friends at a sleepover to keep the lamp on, 
to ward off the webbed arm man. Hannah laughed loudly and said he was just a character from a bedtime story our mom had told us. When I hesitated to retrieve a frisbee from a crawl space that pulsed with a sinister energy or a beach ball that floated too far from the shore, Hannah would rush past me with feigned excitement and recover the item before I could refuse. In some fundamental way, I didn't understand what people expected of me. Once, when I was 10, I proudly showed the supermarket cashier a dead mouse that our cat had killed. I'd been keeping it in a toy handbag. As the cashier shrieked and people in line turned away, my mother said only, she's a little scientist to this one. Well, Hannah apologized and ushered me out the door. My mother, a librarian from New York with wild gray hair that she wore much longer than was fashionable, wasn't perturbed by my behavior or the way the town regarded me. But my father was horrified when mom recounted the story. He buried the mouse, still in the handbag, in the yard while I cried. Dad asked Hannah what I'd been thinking, and Hannah said she wanted it for her bone collection, reluctantly leading him to where I'd stored the sun-bleached skeleton of a possum I'd found by the back fence. Hannah was my opposite in every way. She resembled our dad, sandy-haired, athletic, and approachable. I'm more like our mother dark-eyed with angular features and unruly curls. And Hannah always knew exactly what people expected of her, which was a different sort of burden than the one I carried. She was adored, confided in, and admired. But she had her own anxieties, which she hid from everyone but me. She worried about our father, who she claimed was stressed about money and the properties he managed. She worried that our mother found us boring, she worried about our parents' frequent arguments, about a close friend whose brother was cruel, and I assumed also about me, my fixations, my strangeness, my poor health. I never figured out how Hannah intuited other secrets, but even when she told me about them, they didn't trouble me much. My fears were visceral, that the undercurrent would drag me to sea if I went into the ocean past my knees, that our dad's truck would fishtail in the snow on the drive to school, that there was someone crouching behind the rhododendron bush, ready to grab me every time I rushed onto the porch. I had seen the webbed art man, and I knew he was watching from whatever dusky corner of the universe he resided in. I knew that he was waiting. I'm gonna stop there. <laughs>